My name is Sarah O'Keefe. I'll be doing the webinar today. So welcome aboard to DITA 101, a mostly and hopefully buzzword-free overview of DITA. So my name is Sarah O'Keefe. I'm the founder and president of Scriptorium Publishing. We're based in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. I work here as a consultant and have some experience and background with a lot of different publishing ideas, including, of course, XML and DITA. Our uh, bread and butter work is these days is actually XML implementation. A couple of things before I get started. Um, you can use the chat area in the GoToMeeting control panel to ask your questions. And I will try and address those as I'm going along, if possible. Uh, I'm also going to have about a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period at the end of the webinar, so you can ask your questions there. And I will also provide you with contact information in case you want to follow up after the webcast. So you have a couple of different ways of getting your questions answered, and hopefully that will work out. All of you, other than me, are going to be muted, so you will not be able to ask questions through the audio. You do have to use the chat. Um, but you should be able to uh, do whatever you need to do and not worry about that coming through on the webcast. We are recording this session. However, your information, your name will not appear in the recording itself. And the Q&A session will not be recorded. So just a couple of things there for you to know about how we're organizing this. So I want to talk about what DITA is, some important concepts for it, typical scenarios for it, and then, of course, the $64,000 question, is it right for you? DITA stands for the Darwin Information Typing Architecture. We can break that down. Might as well start in the middle. So information typing is a concept that's actually been around for quite a while. It's the idea that when you create information, you can categorize it by what type of information it is. And the most common types you'll see are task, reference, and concept. There are also similar ones. Uh, tasks sometimes are referred to as procedures. You'll see process, which is a collection of tasks. Or you'll see something like an example information type. So DITA has the idea of information typing that you categorize your content. It has the word Darwin in it because you can evolve you can create new elements from the elements that are provided in DITA. And as we'll see later, this becomes a very powerful way of managing your information and managing the specific organization that you need for your content. Uh, Darwin information typing architecture, as opposed to, for example, structure or XML standard, because it's not just a structure. It's not just a collection of elements or components. It has features in it that help you do things like reuse, single sourcing, and generating output. So they give you an overall organizational scheme for creating content. DITA, and I should point out that in Europe it's usually called DITA, but DITA is, was originally developed by IBM and then was contributed to OASIS, which is the Organization for the Advancement of oh, Structured Information Science or something generally like that. Uh, so it is now an open source standard. It is not owned by IBM. They do certainly still contribute to the committee that manages DITA, but it is now an open source standard that is owned, uh, well, it's not owned. It's owned by the community. So why is it important? Is it important? Where are we with that? Let's back up a little bit and talk about structured authoring. Uh, structured authoring is when you create content, in which the structure that you want in that content is enforced by the software. It's enforced programmatically. This is important because when you enforce via software, this allows you to focus on other things. You don't have to worry about, does my example have the syntax in the correct order? Did we put the parameters before the code example? The structure will enforce that for you. And as a result, you can focus on things like, is it a useful example? You can focus more on the content rather than on, was this document organized correctly? Now, structured authoring, we believe, is the next logical place is to go from template-based authoring. Many of you have probably worked in a template-based authoring environment where 
you're handed a template with a bunch of tags in Word or FrameMaker or something else and told to follow the template. Use only those tags. Don't create new tags. Now, in a template-based authoring environment, tagging and organization is enforced by looking at your documents, perhaps through a peer edit or a dedicated editor. Structured authoring is the next step where you take the template that you want and that you're asking for and you enforce it instead of requesting that people do so. DITA gives you a way of managing structured authoring. It gives you a gateway into structured authoring that has a lower cost of entry than just building it from scratch. Now, there are trade-offs to that, as we'll see later, but that's what's going on here. So what is it? What is DITA? I've told you what the abbreviation stands for and why is it important, but what, what is it actually? It is a collection of XML elements, so it is a standard of XML vocabulary. It was designed to support topic-based authoring. It is potentially a way to work in XML where you do not have to go off and design your own structure. That's, that's potentially a big plus. Uh, it is, of course, a huge buzzword, and you see all the software vendors and everybody else talking about it. And finally, perhaps, a cost-effective way to do what you need to do, to create, reuse, and exchange structured content. So you've got all sorts of different kinds of descriptions of it here, ranging from the sort of technical to the more conceptual. DITA is made up of a number of pieces and parts. There are document type definitions, or DTDs. That is the component that describes the structure. It says, for example, that if you have a task, a task must have a title, and it kind of should have an introductory paragraph of some sort. And then after that, it should have um, steps somewhere in the task. So the document type definitions are where you go to describe the structure that you're interested in enforcing. And DITA gives you the document type definitions out of the box. In addition to the DTDs, DITA has something called the Open Toolkit, which supports production of different kinds of output. Um, by default, in the Open Toolkit, you get HTML, Eclipse Help, Chum, and some various other formats that you can work with. You can also generate PDF content through the Open Toolkit using something called XSLFO. Now, XSL is the extensible style sheet language. It is a programming language that allows you to convert XML into other formats, such as, for example, HTML. XSLFO is XSL formatting objects. XSLFO allows you to convert XML, like DITA content, into things like PDF, into more complex markup or print. XSL is moderately difficult to learn. XSLFO is mm, potentially challenging, quite challenging to learn. And then finally, you have documentation that comes with the DITA package. There is documentation of the Open Toolkit. There's documentation of the structure itself. There's all sorts of stuff in there. So you have components that give you a starting point, at least in theory, to pull all these things together. Now, how does this actually work? Well, when you're publishing in DITA or when you're authoring in DITA, what you're going to typically do is you're going to create topics. So you're going to have tons and tons and tons of little topics, each of which would typically be uh, a task or a description of a concept. If you think of your current documentation and you think of your major headings in the documentation, probably each of your major headings would become its own topic. A topic would typically be somewhere in the vicinity of one to two pages in print. Uh, it's certainly possible to have longer or shorter topics, but what you're generally looking for is a content unit that describes a particular concept, task, or reference, or thing, in a reasonable amount of detail. Now, once you have your topics, the second thing you're going to do is create what's called the map file. The map file lists the topics in a particular sequence and in a particular hierarchy. So the map file is basically the table of contents for your content, for your information. And once you have the map file,